I'm, uh, I'm Patrick Cuthbertson, as you've heard, and my background is in uh, spatial analysis, spatial data collection, uh, and also in lithic analysis. I just finished that uh, postdoc with the Paleo Silk Road project, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'll be talking about our innovative model-led approach, which we applied to locate new karstic caves and rock shelters in Kazakhstan. So the Paleo Silk Road project is an ERC fund project. It's based at the University of Tübingen um, in southern Germany. The uh, PI is Radojovica, and it's a multidisciplinary project that aims to locate and study Paleolithic sites in the area of the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor in Kazakhstan. And uh, we'll hear a little more about the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor in a later slide with a proper definition and everything. Um, so part of that goal of the project includes this model-led approach to locate caves and rock shelters, which was the main focus of my postdoc um, with, with the project over the last few years. Now, uh, the models were built in collaboration with our colleagues uh, Tobias Ullmann and uh, Christian Budel at the University of Würzburg, which is also in Germany. Now, it became the subject of a paper which we published earlier this year in PLOS One. So for our purposes here, Central Asia includes the modern territories of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, and for many people, I think Central Asia really evokes thoughts of these kind of arid, strongly continental, very open environments. Um, people often think of it as hot in the summer, cold in the winter. Um, and I mean, to some extent, this is true of some of the territory, but it's really only part of the story. So there are those arid deserts in the interior, but substantial mountain ranges as well also dominate the southern and eastern areas of the region. And I think sort of very broadly for our purposes here, we can think of the overall physical geography of Central Asia as a sort of opposition between those desertified plains and the more um, sort of humid areas of the mountains and foothills. So these, uh, these mountainous areas receive a substantial amount of precipitation, as do some areas also in, in northern Kazakhstan. And the water that falls in those uh, mountainous areas makes its way into the interior, um, into sort of like uh, the famous inland lakes and inland seas like uh, the Aral and Lake Balkhash, which you can see there. Uh, and it does so uh, as overland runoff from these mountainous areas in rivers like the Amudaria and the Sudaria. Um, and the, the other aspect of this opposition between desertified lowlands and mountainous areas is that much of Central Asia is exposed to some pretty strong aeolian effects, you know, these, these kinds of wind effects. So combined with the aridity, this causes a large number of dust storms in some areas. And the net effect of that is that these fine grained sediments uh, can be uh, eroded and picked up by the wind and then deposited, accumulating against the more mountainous regions, forming these kinds of uh, loessic uh, foothills. And over the course of the Pleistocene and also, also the Holocene more recently, of course, this leads to these huge accumulations uh, of the sediment known as Lus. Um, like uh, I've put an example just on the right of the slide here. Uh, in, in fact, this is quite um, this is quite a conservative uh, lower section. They can get really thick, really deep, um, and in those mountainous areas and foothills, it's this combination of this large amount of precipitation and the loess as well that make these areas extremely ecologically productive. Uh, the mountains also, as well, we should note, have an influence on movement through the region. So they almost certainly uh, constitute this, um, this effect on the northern branch of the Silk Road, 
uh, during historical times and also likely to have been an area of dispersal and occupation for nomadic pastoralists as well uh, during later prehistory. So um, Michael Fruschetti has on that basis termed it uh, the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor for uh, later prehistoric nomads. And it seems likely that these attractive environments were also important in dispersal back into the late Pleistocene as well. So that's been examined by uh, Micah Glantz and her colleagues at Colorado State University in relation to the late Pleistocene. And it's this idea specifically that the PSR projects, the Paleo Silk Road project, wants to test. We want to um, look at that uh, late Pleistocene occupation of the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor in these foothill and Piedmont zones. Uh, and I've also uh, tried to look further back in time as well into the lower Pleistocene, uh, the middle Pleistocene as well with my doctoral thesis at Oxford. And I concluded that this area of the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor was likely to have played a role in, in shaping hominin dispersal occupation then as well. But in terms of the late Pleistocene, uh, anyone who attended uh, Tom Hyams uh, speaking archaeologically talk or happens to have bought a copy of his new book as well, uh, will know that this is an incredibly interesting uh, place during that time. So we're at that most eastern and northerly expanse of the Neanderthal range, and also the mysterious um, Denisovans are doing their thing in the Altai as well. So the late Pleistocene, I think, especially here, is really liable to change rapidly with new evidence. And we're just sort of beginning to pick apart the human story. And caves in particular have provided a lot of that story in the region so far. So for instance, in Uzbekistan with sites like Teshik Tash, uh, Kyrgyzstan with Selungur as well. There's a team from Novosibirsk studying um, uh, uh, Selungur at the moment, which is you know, producing some very interesting results. And of course, the Russian Altai caves as well, incredible cave sites up there, which include the very famous Denisova. So this is part of the reason that we wanted to target caves in our part of the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor in Kazakhstan. And the fact that we were targeting these areas of uh, I suppose you'd call it uh, complex topography. It helps, of course, because a cave-focused survey strategy in the interior probably wouldn't be much use, potentially. Although we will see on some of the models that I'm about to show that some areas in the interior are highlighted. So there might be potentially some surprises waiting there for people who want to survey in the interior for caves. Um, and then, then I suppose another consequence of this opposition between deflated lowlands and this buildup of loess against mountainous areas, which I think is reflected in the Paleolithic archaeological context that we know about in the region as well. So there are a number of deflated surface sites in the interior where they're you know, a bit easier to survey, easier to find on the horizontal relationship but they rarely preserve substantial stratigraphy that can provide good chronological control. Uh, that is changing a little bit. We're starting to get some, some nice dates and some uh, open air sites with uh, a bit of stratigraphy now. And so it's, it's changing a little bit, but that's the general rule of thumb in these more deflated areas. Um, so the, the opposite side of that effect is in the lowest foothills where these sites are really only found where they're eroding from thick lower sections. And this is great in a sense because they can be dated with a higher resolution because of that fantastic uh, stratigraphy that they present. But it's really hard to get the horizontal spatial aspect. So they can, uh, artifacts and sites can really only be located at a few steep exposures in the sediments where natural processes have started to erode them. So for us, this was really a major reason uh, to target caves in the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor. Caves constitute relatively persistent places for activity in the landscape, if of course they are accessible. Um, and this really constrains the spatial expression of behavior versus 
these wide open expanses of the Lurse foothills, for instance. Caves uh, also can have some pretty unique preservation conditions as well. They can preserve good stratigraphic sequences, which potentially give us nice dates if they're not too disturbed. There's a few um, issues, especially with bioturbation in caves, of course. Um, better fossil preservation is sometimes, uh, is sometimes available in, in cave contexts as well. And even as we're finding now, some very cool research uh, continues to come out on this, you can get impressive genetic records, sometimes from the soil alone. So if, if you're interested in developing the chronology of a region, getting good dates on stone tool technologies, fossils and hominin DNA even potentially, caves are a really good place to start, potentially. So why a model-led approach? Why did we build models for locating caves? Now, the area of Kazakhstan is just absolutely huge. And the area of the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor within it is not particularly small either. It's about 211,000 kilometers squared, roughly. And that's larger than the entire area of Kyrgyzstan, for instance. Um, so we needed some way that we were going to be able to reduce that survey area. Uh, Kazakh and Russian researchers in the region have not been idle, of course, and over decades of work, they've located and excavated a fair number of cave sites. We only had a few years in which we wanted to locate more. We wanted to do it in concentrated bursts of summer field work as well. So if we were really going to contribute substantially to the cave record here, we were going to need a proper targeted approach that was going to help us uh, reduce the area and prioritize uh, areas that were most likely going to provide results. Now, building, um, building a model, potentially finding a large number of caves in this area would also let us uh, potentially begin to unpick some of the factors underlying uh, cave location, formation and occupation as well. We had located um, a small number of cave rock shelter features during survey in the Kazakh Altai in 2017, prior to um, building the model, but they were all unsedimented and they weren't quite what we were looking for. So we knew that understanding those factors was going to be important for the longer term work, especially if we wanted to tap into those general factors for the presence of caves and rock shelters, we knew um, that it was quite important to keep it simple and focused on uh, features of cave formation. Uh, and further to that, the less specific our model was, the more likely other researchers would be able to generalize that, um, those models to other areas of the world as well. So the vast majority of known archeological cave sites in the world are in karstic caves and rock shelters. And by that really, I mean, they have a rather specific formation process that takes place within limestones and other similar carbonate rocks. So um, in, in order to target uh, karstic features in particular, uh, we needed some kind of idea of where the limestones were going to be located in our region. And we also needed to know where these deposits might become exposed and therefore accessible. I mean, accessible to um, natural processes of formation and erosion, but also uh, accessible to hominins, of course. So the locations of limestone deposits uh, that we got. We got those from the Sircams project. And these guys are based at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, they've done some amazing work that includes the digitization of hundreds of Soviet geological maps. Systematic mapping survey in the Russian tradition uh, goes way back. It goes back to the reign of Peter the Great. And under the Soviet Union, they continue to develop this uh, scientific mapping tradition. They've been particularly advanced in the areas of uh, geodesy and physical geography. So the geological maps produced during the Soviet era, they're really top notch maps. And it was these maps, especially a batch of them that were 
uh, published in the 1980s that the CIRCAMS team uh, spent years digitizing. So from that CIRCAMS data set, we extracted for analysis uh, polygons or vectors of all, all the formations that included any form of limestone or undifferentiated carbonate, which you can see uh, just mapped out on this map here. It's worth pointing out actually that this is a commercial data set. It's intended, I, I believe, for petroleum industry, um, mineral and ore inspectors, this, these kinds of uh, audiences who have a lot of money to pay for this stuff. But in our discussion with the CIRCAMS team, they've actually agreed that we could release the limestones and carbonates that we used, so long as we release them in this modified form. So that data is actually now available for free online through the Open Science Framework. And that's a bit of a win for open science, I think. So for the, uh, the second component of the model, um, we needed to identify breaks in the landscape and where these, uh, these limestone deposits could be exposed and therefore accessible. So some type of landform classification was going to be necessary for that. And our collaborator Tobias settled on using this concept of, uh, and method of topographic position index or TPI. Now, TPI is, um, is a form of neighborhood analysis uh, based on elevation data, by which I mean it sort of defines every location in a landscape by comparing the elevation values around that location in a specified uh, neighborhood, um, a sort of neighborhood distance, I guess. And in the case of uh, TPI, it's an attempt to define the overall shape of the landscape at particular scale. So looking to define ridges, valleys, and anything in between. And we used for this the ASTA uh, DEM, Digital Elevation Model, resampled to a 35 meter resolution to kind of fit with the scale of analysis we were doing. And that data is freely available online. Um, they have even like a slightly uh, more precise version of what we were using. I think if you want to use the exact one that we used, you have to actually contact them now, but uh, because they've released this uh, higher resolution version now. And, and so this, this TPI, you can do it with larger and smaller defined neighborhoods around points in the landscape. And you can produce this um, by combining them, you can produce multi-scalar TPIs. And that's exactly what Toby did. So mapping the TPI values throughout our study region that related to slopes and breaks in the landscape using three sizes of neighborhood um, and combining them, the resulting model was therefore multi-scalar and it wasn't dependent on geomorphology at one particular scale. So Toby uh, combined these TPI values from different scales, clipped them to the extent of the near surface limestone vectors and produced our first model, which we call the 2018 model. So here's an example of that model focused on the Karatau mountain range in the south of our study region. In figures C, D and E, you can see that the results of uh, um, these three different scales of, of neighborhood. Um, and you can presumably see that E looks a bit um, smoother, and this is because it's a higher um, scale. Whereas as you go to like, um, as you go to like D and C, you can see that it's uh, a bit uh, more broken up, there's more detail, and that represents the neighborhoods getting kind of a bit smaller. And these different, um, these different neighborhoods of TPI were then combined and could be classified into three different classes, which we show in red, yellow, and green in figure F. Now, the three colors here relate to the number of scales at which an area was identified as a break in the landscape. So the green areas are flagged at only one scale. The yellow areas were flagged at two scales. And the red areas were flagged all three scales of the TPIs that we ran. So red were really our highest priority for surveying that. So with Professor Jacquentai Magambitov, we hit the road 
to survey in the summer of 2018. As you can, has worked on the Paleolithic of the region for decades. He's immensely knowledgeable. He is also an avid field worker, very, very serious about his field work. And he's written a formidable number of books on the archeology span of Kazakhstan. So we were really in very safe hands with him. We needed some sort of uh, technological setup as well that was going to let us uh, take our model to the field. And we settled on using a sort of mobile GIS app on an iPad mini. And we had an external uh, GNSS surveyor to give us accurate real-time location data as well. So this meant that we could really take the model with us into the field, have it constantly available. We could plan our survey. We could even navigate in relation to the model and where we were in position to the model in real time out on the slopes. It was really it was an amazing setup to have. And we used the mobile GIS as well for our data recording of features in the field. We, uh, we structured our data collection to ultimately be compatible with Dene Reed's uh, PaleoCore database structure. And the goal there is eventually having a, a PSR PaleoCore database. And one of, uh, one of Radu's uh, graduate students at NYU, Emily Coco, has been working on that fairly recently. Now, we stayed extremely mobile to cover as much ground as possible, basically camping every night in a new place during the survey. We had a generator to charge our equipment, that kind of thing. And we actually didn't return to the Kazakh Altai in 2018, but we did survey pretty extensively in the south and the southeast. Now, the level of discrimination in the 2018 model allowed us to locate areas that were likely to present karstic features, but tracking them down within these broad zones was a bit trickier. So various factors uh, were involved there, including vegetation, accessibility, you know, accessibility either from the road or, or on foot as well, this complicated matters. We used uh, binoculars, of course. We even used a drone, and we had some success uh, investigating features that way. There were a couple of features that we really got our best initial look at them through the drone's uh, camera and that sort of thing. So that was quite that was quite exciting. Now, a couple of the features we picked up were uh, known tourist caves in the region. So those were fairly easy they had signs pointing directly to them right um a few we were also directed to specifically by jacan so uh Jacquin, of course has excavated several caves and rock shelters during his career in the region however a great many we also found by ourselves just guiding our survey with the model and keeping our eyes open we found it was very effective in combination with a more traditional approach, of course, asking locals in areas that had high predictive value. You know, locals could help us locate some features that we just would never have seen from the road or even walking straight past them in the bottom of the same valley. School teachers, shepherds and children, these guys always know if there are caves around locally. They're, they're a great resource for this kind of survey. So in total, we identified, um, uh, we identified 77 cave and rock shelter features, uh, which are shown here on this map as white dots. And you can also see, um, you can also see our predictive values there mapped across, uh, mapped across the whole region. Now, 50 of these cave and rock shelter features we actually found in just one month of quite intensive survey, especially down in the south there. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of them are down there in the south around this, uh, this spur, this ridge, which is the Karatau range. Um, and there's a smattering there towards the east as well. Uh, you can, from, from a 2018 model perspective, you can ignore those ones up in the northeast around the Kazakh Altai, because those are the ones we found in 2017. Now, after the 2018 survey, we therefore had a, a good sample of cave and rock shelter features um, to be going forwards with, and this allowed us to produce a more targeted model for 2019. So we used a supervised minimum distance approach, which uses those locations of the features that we identified in 2018, and it looks for landscape morphometric features 
common to those locations. So once again, here is a sort of zoomed in example of the Karatown mountain range for our model uh, in the south of the study region. Now, an advantage of the minimum distance approach is its simplicity, is, is what Tobias tells me. <laughs> um, and that's ultimately good for processing time. It's good for replicability as well. And it also allows us to identify specific landscape morphologies that are most relevant for feature location. And that's really a huge advantage, I think, because some of these predictive models, they can get very black box. They can get good at predicting locations and they can find you novel locations, but you don't always know why or what kind of real world features the models are latching onto. Whereas the case here is that you can actually um, figure out which specific landscape morphologies are creating that pattern. Um, so there, there are some examples here as well of the morphometric features that we used to produce the rule image for the analysis. So figure C here shows valley depth. Uh, figure D shows a kind of standardized height. And figure E shows uh, slope height. Now, in combination, uh, those and also uh, several other morphometric features provided the rule image, which is shown in figure F. And that forms the basis of the minimum distance analysis. And figure G, you can see that we classified the results into three classes of predictive value following a fairly sort of similar approach to the 2018 model. Though actually it's worth pointing out that because the analyses are not exactly the same, um, they're not, the classes aren't exactly equivalent. <clears throat> so these are the predictive classes from that new model mapped over the entire study region. And I think hopefully you can see that the area that the model highlights there is much, much smaller. It's also much greener, which is due to that uh, significant narrowing of the highest predictive classes. And this really helped us to focus our survey in 2019, during which we found a further 28 cave and rock shelter features, which is nice. Um, we surveyed in all of our study areas in 2019, including also returning to the Kazakh Altai. But again, you can see that the majority of the features were found in the south of the study region and a few to the east as well. So going into the uh, results a little bit, these photos should give you an idea of the kinds of features we were finding and recording during our surveys. And they give some idea maybe of uh, the kind of structural relationship of these features to the carbon deposits as well. So figure B shows the mid slope position of a cave formed along vertical joints in the northwestern side of the Karatau range. And this is pretty typical. You would find that these things would be positioned kind of in mid slope positions, um, and which was interesting from an accessibility point of view at any rate. Um, figure C here shows a closer view of a rock shelter in the same range. And our definition of a rock shelter for these purposes was very simple, just based on dimensions of the negative feature. It just had to be wider than it was deep. Figure D shows a, a cave in the southeast of our study region around the Ilialatau area. And by our definition, a cave, it was also just based on dimensions, the definition. It was just a negative feature that's deeper than it is wide. And you can see here quite nicely, a large accumulation of sediment. And this forms um, this slope in front of the cave. And uh, spotting that kind of slope, that kind of sediment cone, that can sometimes be the jackpot for archeologists as far as cave surveys are concerned. So in total, we found 105 cave and rock shelter features using this model led survey approach. 28 of them contain some form of sediment accumulation. And uh, so, so I would report like on, on a model basis, we found 105 cave and rock shelter features. Um, one of our doctoral students, Aris Varis, is drilling in deeper to some of the structural and sedimentational 
aspects of the caves and he's a bit stricter with his definition so i think when he's he's about to submit his paper but he's whittled it down now to i think it's 97 or 95 that he's happy to accept uh, as true cave and rock shelter features but as far as the models are concerned it was about uh, 105 uh, by the definition we were running on in terms of that data collection um there with with the models there was a significant increase in discrimination between the 2018 and 2019 models which you can see here um overall we managed to reduce areas highlighted in the 2018 model by over 60 percent for the 2019 model and we reduced areas of the highest class values significantly as well in terms of what this meant on the ground a rough approximation would be to say something along the lines of um, the 2018 model could highlight whole valleys within a mountain range that might be good for survey while the 2019 model was more sensitive and it could sort of direct us to specific areas within individual valleys to some extent and this this is part of the analysis that i find very interesting so in terms of the morphometric features of importance for cave prediction from the 2019 model these box plots show a comparison of those uh, landscape features that we used in the minimum distance analysis. Our cave and rock shelter locations are the ones in blue. And we compare these to a random sample of 1000 points from carbon areas generally, which are in orange. Carbon areas within our study region, I should say. So the morphometric features where uh, these box plots overlap the least indicate features that are more indicative of cave and rock shelter location than the random sample. Um, whereas the ones where they overlap more, they're likely to be hitting on features which are more common throughout carbon areas generally. So in particular, this highlights that caves and rock shelters in our study region are often situated in areas of steep terrain, in positions with higher valley depths and slope heights, and also at areas of uh, intermediate slope position. And this is something we can definitely confirm because we had to hike to them. And this wasn't always, um, this wasn't always easy to do, <laughs> quite rough terrain some of the times. So in conclusion, we can say we found predictive models to be highly effective for targeted survey of karstic cave and rock shelter features using lithological data in combination with unsupervised landform classification, identified a large number of karstic features in field survey with not really any prior information of feature location included in the model. Um, subsequent supervised landform classification using our field observations allowed us to further narrow down the survey area as well and identify morphometric landscape features that were the best predictors of feature location. We should highlight as well that a major advantage of these models is that they're relatively simple and they're also replicable. So potentially they can be generalized, used in other areas. Into the future, I think that the project is keen to differentiate further lithological factors. So um, that might be uh, relevant stuff like the age of, of the carbonates in specific mountain ranges, how that relates to cave and rock shelter formation. And I think those are things that Aris is going to start looking into, is already looking into, I'm fairly certain. And I know that the project's very keen, especially to target features containing sediment, because these are the most likely to provide us with the archaeological material that's going to help us advance the chronology of the region. Ultimately, I'd say the models have been, uh, have been successful in helping us locate these karstic features. And it's also very encouraging that these methods could be usefully applied in other study regions as well. So I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people for contributing to this work and making it possible. Uh, and of course, you know, everyone for tuning in and, and listening. Um, in particular, though, I'd really like to dedicate this talk to our colleague Gani Iskakov, who helped us a lot on survey and excavation in 2018, but has sadly since passed away.